Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of the Typical Skeptic Podcast. Um, you know me, I like to get into ancient history and like the Anunnaki and ancient Persia and ancient Israel and ancient Babylon and what like and and, and ancient religion and 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 uh, like even though I'm not very religious myself, I still respect it and I res- respect what's in the Bible and what it can teach us. And and what we're going to be getting into tonight is an is a is an insane mystery that um this man is uncovered and who I'm talking about is Jim Barfield and, and he's with the Copper Scroll Mystery. Um, this Copper Scroll Mystery is similar to the Dead Sea Scrolls, but we're going to learn a lot more about it tonight. And a little bit more about my guest is Jim is a retired criminal investigator with multiple career positions leading up to his retirement from the Lawton, Oklahoma Fire Department in August 2005. And a little bit about more of the, the Copper Pro- Skull Project. Um, an avid Bible study student, Jim Barfield studied the Dead Sea Scrolls that led him to the information about the Copper Scroll, which has descriptions of valuable treasures such as artifacts, gold, silver, gems. Legend has it that once the scroll is discovered, it will lead to the end of times. For nearly 2,400 years, the scroll laid in a cave near Kerbet Qumran, high above the shores of the Dead Sea until 1952. The deteriorating rolls lay side by side on a stone outcropping the cave hidden, according to records, by a desperate team of holy men seeking to preserve their faith. One single sheet of hammered copper, the other larger roll contained two similar sheets of end to end. Barely visible text pressed on the thin copper teased those who could read it unmercifully. Scholar disagreements on how the thing bounced back and forth over the five years, but the document was ever to be open. Something had to be done. Finally, experts formulated a workable plan to open the scroll and delicate task fell to Professor H. Wright Baker of Manchester University. Now fragile as glass, the scroll would be cut into sections using tiny precision circular saw. With great care, the process began. And that's what we're going to get into tonight. And his website is www.copperskullproject.com. And I want to give Jim a big warm welcome to the show. Jim, thank you for joining me. How are you? Well, thank you very much. I'm, I'm doing great. And it's a pleasure to be here. I appreciate it very much. How did you uh, first get into this? Because I know it said you studied the Dead Sea Scrolls. What information led you to, to start researching like these like esoteric like truths and stuff like that? You know, it, and it was purely from a Bible study standpoint. I mean, I, I am a strong believer, and, and I believe that, uh, that the Dead Sea Scrolls have got an incredibly significant tie with the prophets of, <laughs> excuse me, the prophets of Israel and with uh, Jesus, John the Baptist, uh, but you, you name it. Uh, those guys were directly linked with the Bible, Old Testament, New Testament, all of it. And people just don't realize it. And it's covered up in our, in our dogmatic understandings of the Bible. I mean, it's good to be, stand by your faith and, and, and it be steady with it. Uh, you never want to change quickly. You want to do everything slowly and make sure you know what you're talking about. But let me tell you this. Those documents, if I'm right, and the items that we believe are, will be found uh, anytime soon, it's going to change the face of religion, the Judeo-Christian religion. It's going to change it significantly as far as our dogmas. We're going we're gonna to want to learn more, and, and I believe that's what the, God wants from us, is to n- not necessarily have an open mind, but be open to learning. And, and getting more information from God is God is bigger than just the Old Testament. He's bigger than just the New Testament. And matter of fact, the Bible even says there's no way you can contain all the knowledge uh, about God in, in one book. So that's the reason I got into it was because of Bible study. And what information is, oh, okay, well, let me ask you this. Can you tell the audience like what was found like when they found these copper scrolls, what was found with it? I, it says that there were like gold, silver, and gems and stuff. Like, is that all true? No, that's a misunderstanding. It's not that gold, silver, and gems was found with it. Uh, what ha- what it is, is the copper scroll is a verbal treasure map. It tells you where the locations of massive, massive quantities of gold, silver, and gems and artifacts. There's... Uh, According to which document you read, there's hundreds of thousands of bowls, cups, platters. It's for the services in the uh, in the temple, second uh, first temple, uh, King Solomon's temple. 
That's what's located and buried at a specific spot that we'll be talking about here in just a little bit. Yeah, uh, and who who do you think buried this? Do you think it was King Solomon, and do you think it goes back to his time? No, I don't believe he was the one that buried it. He, King Solomon uh, prepared for it. He's a very wise man. He wasn't real smart. I mean, any guy that's got more than, uh, you know, one wife is not real bright. And he just, but he was incredibly smart. He, he figured out ways to protect the, uh, the precious artifacts, including the Ark of the Covenant. So he didn't bury it. But he made preparations in case that time ever came, and it did. Uh, they actually, who was operating at that time, was King Zedekiah. He wasn't a good king. He was a lousy, uh, <coughs> non-religious guy. He didn't believe in much at all, uh, except making himself more wealthy and gaining more power. Not a good guy. However, the guy that was working with him on the opposite side of the fence, now we're Get into the guys at Qumran. Qumran is where all these items were found, the, uh, where all the uh, scrolls, the copper scroll, and many other scrolls. That he, guy. Oh, sorry. Oh, go God. ahead. Uh, 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 who was that? Uh, that was Jeremiah. Okay. That was the prophet Jeremiah. And I can tell you, um, I want your audience to listen closely. Because Jeremiah was the guy that ran this entire operation, and he ran the operation from Jerusalem, where he's been held captive. Uh, his his uh, scribe, uh, I guess I can't remember his name, Baruch, Baruch the, was the scribe of Jeremiah. Baruch had all the, uh, uh, ran back and forth from Jerusalem to Qumran and laid out the plans for burying all the items that we're talking about here today. And, and what all items did they find? Like, what, what all were, were found when they found it? Okay, well, I'm, I'm trying to think of where the best way to take this conversation would be. I was going to say, what did they find? But then I, I kind of wanted to know, like, how were the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Ark of the Covenant, and the Copper Scroll all related? Well, <clears throat> the guys at Qumran, now when I understand there's Jerusalem. Yeah. Jerusalem is where the center of uh, the commerce, where... Uh, education, secular education, where uh, the temple was at, religious activities uh, were right there in Jerusalem and the kingdom. That's where the government was at. However, about 13 miles to the east of there is a little place called Qumran. And I want you to understand, I, I found, I discovered this, is that Qumran and Jerusalem were mirror images, or let's just say Jerusalem uh, its footprint is at Qumran. They built Qumran to be identical or near identical to Jerusalem at the time of Jeremiah. That whole city, that little, the whole uh, complex or community is shaped just like Jerusalem. The buildings are named uh, as the same as the ones in Jerusalem. So it's a very significant, important place. And that's how the tie comes. All, all three scriptures, you see where uh, the kings of Israel were making mistakes and a prophet would show up out of the wilderness, out of nowhere. And that's the reason they were showing up out of nowhere is they were coming in out of Qumran, going to Jerusalem to uh, get on to the kings and the prophets that were doing the wrong things, doing things the improper way. Qumran was like the golden rule. Anytime you wanted to compare to make sure that over the centuries you were doing the way things the way God wanted them, you would go to Qumran and get the information from those guys. Now that is where you could that is that also like, for the. Oh, I'm sorry, I just wanted to say you could say like Qumran was like a really enlightened place. Oh gosh, it was the most holy place of all of uh, Jerusalem except for the temple. But Qumran was a very, very holy place. Uh, when you walk on Qumran, you're walking on the same ground that the prophets of Israel were on. And those guys had to maintain a high, high level of holiness. So it, it was very, very important to the, the re religion of Israel. That's so interesting. Now, what do you think? If, I know you studied this stuff. What do you think the Ark of the Covenant was? And like, what do you think it is? And do you think it still exists? Oh, I do believe it, it exists. And what I think is the Ark of the Covenant 
it, it somehow, <clears throat> it had somehow produced its own power. Was, was it electrical power? Was it, uh, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know what kind of power it was, but for example, whenever they would walk through the wilderness well, carrying that ark on the, uh, the priest would carry it, the thing would, uh, if, if there were scorpions or snakes along the path, to make sure that whoever was carrying it didn't get bit or would drop the ark, that somehow the ark would kill those animals to keep them away from the priest as they carried it through the wilderness. Very interesting that, how they could do those sort of things. And another time, there was a there was a time that the ark of the covenant was on a cart, and the oxen were dry, pulling it back uh, towards a particular location. And it started to teeter and, and wobble as it was on that cart. And a guy just reached up to steady it with his hand, apparently. And when he touched it, he died instantly. Now, was it an electrical charge? Was it? Uh, I don't know. And uh, we probably, there's no one that I know of that has an idea. Maybe some of the more esoteric, the well-learned uh, Jewish people's rabbis would know, but uh, I don't know what, what was the actual source of the power of the uh, Ark of the Covenant. Do you think it got taken? I, I had some, I, I was someone come on my show. She's from Ethiopia and said that, she, they did, you know, there's like a sect of Jewish people in Ethiopia. And I think like supposedly they, they have the Ark of the Covenant. Is that true? Well, they believe that they do. Uh, and and I, I wouldn't I wouldn't argue with them. Uh, to me, it's important that the ark is found, not who finds it. But I don't think it is, to be honest with you. Um, from what I've heard to people that have actually seen it, it's not at all just as it's described in in the Bible <coughs> and other sources, Jewish sources. Yeah. So well, do that. go ahead. But I was going to say, like, what does this all mean for us? Like, as far as like our future and like, what is, what is, is the Copper Scroll project, like, or, or is this Copper Scrolls and the Dead Sea Scrolls and, and the Ark of Covenant, is it all a sign that end times are near? I absolutely believe it is. Uh, it's, it's the Ark of the Covenant is, is a sign only when it's found. Uh, it's a very important uh, artifact. It's probably the most important artifact that we'll find. And there is a possibility that uh, we've identified the, a cave where the, uh, the, uh, the Ark of the Covenant is located. But how significant it is, it's huge, huge. All of this, the, the ancient writings that were uh, provided through, uh, for example, um, the book of Maccabees. You've ever heard of first and second Maccabees? No, I haven't they're, heard of that. They are I, uh, what there's called apocryphal writings. They're in addition to the Bible. They don't hold the same status as the books of the Bible, but they are very important, especially historically. They've got uh, some amazingly interesting and solid information in them. And one of the books in particular, 2 Maccabees, second chapter, it says that Jeremiah, same guy we've been talking about tonight, Jeremiah took the Ark of the Covenant, the uh, table of showbread, altar of incense, uh, and, and the Ark of the Covenant, with, along with the entire tabernacle of Moses. That is massively important. And, and he buried them inside of a cave, then sealed the entrance. In other words, he took all those items with a lot of other stuff, put them inside of a cave. Then he took stones uh, and, and put a, built a masonry wall. And then it, and it appears that he probably, they probably smeared um, a stucco kind of uh, plaster and sealed it, but tried to make it watertight for the centuries that it was going to be buried. So is it significant for us today? Oh my gosh, yes. They, and they're being found at a very important time because that same document, 2 Maccabees, second chapter, says that when these items are found, it will be the time of the coming of the Messiah and the regathering of the nation of Israel. Huge in biblical prophecy. And is that kind of what the cop chopper school says? And then also, 
Um, didn't you uh, translate this copper scroll yourself? I, I think I heard that on Coast to Coast that you sat there and you you translated this your, the, the, yourself, correct? Uh, did I translate it myself? I, translating, it means you understand Hebrew very well. I don't. What I did was uh, even more efficient is I used a Strong's Concordance. Now, the, every... Well, almost every studious Bible student has a copy of Strong's Concordance. Back in the day, you know, 20 years ago, you just had a, it's a really thick book and you carried it around. And if you wanted to look up a Hebrew word to see what it meant, you used the Strong's Concordance. Well, luckily today we had, we have, uh, <clears throat> oh, computer programs, which makes it a so much easier. You want to find a word, you look it up. And that's what I did is I took, I, dis, I distinguished each individual word, letter and word on the copper scroll. And once I got an entire sentence, then I would go back and I would look the word up in the Strong's Concordance, plug in the meaning and the Strong's Concordance number so I could go back at any given time and, and look it up again very easily and show people this is why I use this word. And that's what I did. And which is strange because all these guys with these, you know, PhDs, they've been working on it since 1952 and they couldn't figure it out. And then within, and I'm not joking, within five minutes, I knew how to understand the scroll. Within 20 minutes, I knew I had already figured out the first five locations. That is just crazy. Uh, and and the, the guys with the PhDs, really poo-pooed me and, you know, said a lot of mean things about me until one day they looked at my research and then all of their comments, their mean comments stopped. And what did it say when you, when you, when you did, when you were able to translate it, what is it, what is the meaning of, uh, uh, I guess what the question is, what did, uh, my first question is, what is the meaning of it? Like, what is it trying to tell us? The Copper Scroll is, <clears throat> all it is, again, it's just a map. It's not, it's not a literature, literary work where, you know, they're telling a story. Uh, they're not telling, you know, songs and that sort of thing. It's simply, here's, here's how it starts. And this is the most important line on the Copper Scroll. It says, under the ruins in the Valley of Accor. Well, I knew where the Valley of Accor was. I'd been studying the Dead Sea Scrolls for years. So I knew where that was at. And the only set of ruins that I was familiar with was the ruins of Qumran. So I arbitrarily just picked up my map that I had of Qumran laying there on my desk. And I said, I'll just start here because it says under the ruins in the Valley of Accor. I thought, well, I will test this set of ruins. And if it doesn't match the descriptions on this copper scroll, I'll just go to another set of ruins. Not a problem. After the first five, I knew that all I had to do was find the locations as they were described on the Copper Scroll in the ruins of Qumran. That's how that happened. So is it a literary work? Nope. Is it? It tells an amazing story, however. It tells a story of about how men, uh, a team, five different teams of men, buried these items. And, and placed them all around inside of the ruins of Qumran. And it was right after a major battle that darn near captured the complex. And had that happened, Israel would have lost all of its treasures and history uh, from Qumran. And like, where is, did you narrow down that this treasure is? Like, do you have an idea and are you going to go there and excavate it? And you already have excavated a certain area part, a, a, a certain area. You already excavated Qumran, right? Well, I didn't excavate it. What happened was I took my research to the head of the Antiquities Authority of Israel. His name is Shuka Dorfman. He thought, at first he thought I was crazy. And he kind of he kind of laughed and he was very kind, but you could tell he thought, oh, my gosh, I'm wasting my afternoon. But he, what we did is we took that. He took my research as I explained each one, because I only got to the fifth location showing it to him. I showed him the first one. He was kind of interested. Second one, he got closer. 
he was enthralled. By the time I got to the fifth location, I had him hooked. He grabbed his phone, pulled his out of his leather bag, and he called his secretary, and he set up a meeting with me, Yitzhak Magan, the head of the Antiquities Department of the Civil Administration, and the lead archaeologist for Qumran, which was Yuval Peleg. He had them meet me at his office after that, and they wanted them to see my research, and they did. That's how the research uh, turned into an excavation, because Yuval, the archaeologist, he really liked my work. And so we went to Qumran. He and I went to Qumran with uh, some of my crew. He brought his crew that actually did the excavation. I didn't, I didn't dig anything. I didn't touch anything. Uh, that was purely up to the Antiquities Authority, which is rightfully so. I mean, that, that belongs to Israel, not to me. Yeah, but I mean, so what's going to happen now? Like, are they, can they can they find the treasure? Like, or are, are, do you have more excavating to go, or where where does this story go from here? Oh, we got a massive, massive quantity of excavations to go. There were there are fifty seven locations. He promised me we'd go down six feet, two meters. Now that's over six feet, actually to go down uh, six feet and we'd dig in the spot where I believe that the, uh, the buried cave was out that we talked about in second Maccabees, that location is the most valuable of all, but there's 56 more locations that have got massive quantities of gold and silver and gems. One location, location number two on the copper scroll has 900 talents of gold. You know how big a talent is? It's huge. It's huge, right? It's I, 75 I, 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 pounds. I don't know figures, but uh, it's, I know it's pretty huge. 75 pounds. Oh, wow. 900. Let's, uh, let's cut it in half, just for grins. Let's cut it in half. 75 cut in half. You've got, you've got a massive, you have 35 pounds or more, 37.5 uh, pounds. You take those that weight. Multiply it by 14, because there's 14 ounces, troy ounces in a pound, okay? Troy ounces is what they measure the weight of uh, precious metals. And then you do the math on it, 900 talents is equal to uh, over $1 billion if they only weigh 35 pounds. If they actually weigh 75 pounds, you're talking close to $2 billion in, in gold at one location. And that's one out of 57. Wow. Wow. That's amazing. Like, and, and, and this, this is insane. Like what, what is stopping the thing from going on? Like, why, why don't you think it's happening? Oh, I know what it is. Politics. Politics. Okay. And, and you, whether you're a believer or not, you got to understand that there is good and evil. And this is the most significant time in history for good and evil to show its head. We are, we are at, I hear it a lot, a precipice. We are at a very critical time that I believe that God is going to reveal himself soon. And there's going to be, there's going to be hell to pay. If, if we don't get through this, we, the whole world right now is in an uproar. I mean, look at the problems in Brazil, the problems in China, the problems in the United States, which is not as bad as those two countries. We've got massive problems, and it's, it's on a scale of good versus evil. People who want to do good and people that don't particularly give a darn, and they're just wild. It's like Sodom and Gomorrah in the United States and all over the world. Pedophilia is just rampant throughout our world. And how did that happen? I mean, the average person doesn't know, didn't know about it. Yeah. But there's some really wicked people in our government, in our government that is involved in that stuff. But it's a, and that's why I'm saying that this is a very significant time in history and in biblical history. Do you think that like what uh, this creator, God, our God, the creator will, 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 um, like make his presence known and try to clean up like 
the world, like uh, in in the from its current state of affairs, like or does it have to get kind? Of, does the world kind of have to hit rock bottom first before God steps in? You put it very well. Rock bottom is what we're going to have to hit. Uh, I think God is going to allow us because He gave us dominion over this world, and we are going to have to hit rock bottom before He's going to step up and do what He's got to do. And I don't like that. Cool. I'm sorry, go ahead. It makes me think, I'm sorry, where did this all start? Like, did this all start with, like, if we go, I know you're a Bible student. I wanted to talk to you about this, too. Like, does this all start with the book of Enoch? Like, I know it's not widely accepted in the mm. regular Bible canon, but I know um, some 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 sects of religion uh, accept the book of Enoch. But um, in the book of Enoch, it talks about the fallen angels, who I think might have been the Anunnaki. Um, that they came down, they gave man gifts that we weren't supposed to have. Um, you know, they, I, I don't know how, whatever you want to say they gave us, but they supposedly, I mean, do you follow the book of Enoch and what are your thoughts on it? I, I just started studying Enoch about uh, two years ago. And buddy, I believe that book is incredibly important. It's just, it gives me cold chills sitting here whenever I think about the information that's in the book of Enoch. The book of Enoch is like the book of Genesis on steroids. It just gives you all kinds of details and information of why all these things happen. Why, for example, have you ever heard, and this is part of what you're talking about, have you ever heard of the Azazel goat or the Day of Atonement? No, if you could tell us about it, that sounds interesting. Like it's Yeah, well, you if you've read the book of Enoch, you've read the story of, uh, the Azazel goat. What it is, Azazel was one of the angels that was bad. And, and what they do is on the Day of Atonement, they reenact, they reenact the story of Azazel. Azazel and, and, his, and the fallen angels did some really <laughs> wicked stuff. They were uh, having sex with, the, uh, with women, earthly women, uh, obviously pretty cute girls because they wanted them really bad and they got them pregnant yeah. and, and uh, God was not happy about this. They, those guys were supposed to be, listen, they were supposed to be watching over us to keep us from doing some pretty wicked stuff. And turned out that Enoch, he was such a good guy that he wound up going to God saying, Hey, God, give these guys a chance. And I'm paraphrasing, obviously. But he was standing up for them, and you know God wasn't happy about that because he said, "I sent those people to take care of you, not you take care of them." So, is the Book of Enoch important? Oh my goodness, yeah. I I find it to be one of the most interesting books, and I and I do think they should have been always. Excuse me, it should have been a um, part of the Bible. But I know that um, I know that like I think it's a Methuselah. Or Lamech, that's the the father of Noah. He goes to find Enoch, and Enoch's amongst the gods. And um, he says that he has this baby that it has like white skin and blonde hair, and the baby's like levitating, you know. And they think it's weird because like they think that this baby has to have come from like God, right? Isn't that kind of how it goes? Yeah, it is. That's pretty close. I don't know about the levitating thing, but uh, I think his skin color, his hair, and and again, it's been a a year or two since I've read it, but it's pretty amazing. And he was, for some reason, incredibly in important and special young man because he was such a righteous person that he was taken. And and I believe there's a very high probability he's still alive today. Noah. Uh, well, Noah, no, not Noah. I'm sorry. I thought you were talking about Enoch at that uh, point. Enoch, I'm sorry. I mean, but yeah, Noah, Noah was... Noah was Nero was, uh, he was an incredibly special guy as well. And, and, and they also called Noah like Zia Sudra or Atra. If you read the Sumerian versions of the story, or, you know, if you read Sumerian stories, like the, in that he's called Atrahasis, right? He, uh, he, he, Enki tells Atrahasis in that, in that version to, to build a boat because the gods in that story are, are going to end the earth. So, 
or the, 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 the gods were going to cause a flood. They're the Anunnaki were going to cause a flood. I don't know if you've gotten to the Sumerian literature, but I find that really gripping too. It's really captivating. And I'd like kind of comparing the two because I don't know much. I don't know a lot about the Bible, but I've read the Sumerian stories pretty thoroughly. But I have an understanding of the book, a little bit about the book of Enoch. And I, I think we can tie those two together, that the, the, the Anunnaki and the fallen angels. What do you think? I do. I, I think there's a tie, a connection of some kind. People think sometimes uh, because they talk about, you know, crafts, uh, uh, like what would be considered UFOs today. UFO just means an unidentified object, yeah. flying object. That's all it means. And, and believe me, there's, a, there's some scripture in the New Testament that has something similar to that. And I don't, I, I don't want your, your audience to think that I'm some kind of UFO nut. I'm not. I'm interested in anything that has truth in it. And there's things within the New Testament that you can't explain uh, by just saying that it was, uh, you know, some little fat kid with wings flying around. That's harder for me to believe than, you know, a, a, some type of uh, craft that uh, chariots, like chariots of the gods, a chariot that Ezekiel rode in. It's it's way more easy for me to to visualize something like that than it is you know, a chariot being drawn by horses flying through the sky. That I'm not, I'm not going there. So anyway, you understand what I'm saying? But yes, I do think there is a very strong connection between what is called the Anunnaki and the fallen angels. And fallen angels are not good guys. Yeah. And I was going to ask you, what do you think of the Gnostic stuff? Do you, did you ever get into that? Like, and does that have a place in like what in your studies? Um, Gnostic, there's there's agnostic, Gnostic, <clears throat> Gnostic just means knowledge, and agnostic means without knowledge or away from knowledge. Yeah. Then there's another form of it. So yeah, that's I mean, all it is is terminology of where you stand in this whole picture. Do you believe in God? Well, you're agnostic. If, if you believe in God, you, you know you are with knowledge. You have knowledge of God. But I'm talking about the Gnostic Gospels that they found. They supposedly found they found like these. They they were like uh, pieces of paper that were in a jar. Uh, I think they found them in Egypt or somewhere. I, I can't remember exactly. Yeah, the Nag Hammadi Library is what. Yeah, that's exactly yeah, the Nag Hammadi. Yeah, yeah. What are your thoughts on the Nag Hammadi? I think I think they're very interesting. I don't I don't believe all of them. Uh, there's some of them that you know talk about uh, Yeshua, Jesus. Uh, he formed a, a bird out of clay and, and the bird took off flying. And I'm, I'm oversimplifying the story, but, you know, I kind of go away, hey, guys, come on. You know, he doesn't need additional stories because I really believe there are additional stories about, about Jesus that were concocted just to try to, uh, you know, build his stature up. And that's, that's ridiculous. He doesn't need additional stories to build his stature up. You know, let his story stand on its own. And uh, where do you go think ahead. he was then? Do you think he was the Messiah? Yes, I do. I believe that Yeshua was the Messiah uh, ben Joseph. Uh, Mashiach ben Joseph is the way it's pronounced. I do believe that. I mean, he fits the uh, description of the Messiah ben Joseph incredibly well. Uh, he matches the Daniel story when it says that, you know, at a specific time, this, this Messianic, Messianic figure this Messiah will arrive. He, he matched that exactly. And in the Dead Sea Scrolls, it, it sets, there's three dates that are set in the Dead Sea Scrolls and it matches to Yeshua, Jesus, and, and to the stories exactly. I mean, his birth in the Dead Sea Scrolls, it, it described the date of his birth to the year. Perfect. And his crucifixion to the year and to the day. Perfectly. But, so yeah, but there's a lot of times. Do you think it went astray, like with Rome, kind of like taking his story and kind of doing whatever they wanted with it? Uh, a lot of things went awry with with the Rome. Um, yeah, there is. I don't want to. I don't mean to bash any religion. Yeah. But I can tell you that uh, if reading reading a story, let me just put it this way: reading a story in Hebrew is very much more significant and, and understandable than reading it in Greek. In other words, 
the guys at Qumran were directly tied with Yeshua, Jesus. And and they were they were tied so much with him, they've got a prophecy of when he would be born. How does that happen? They, they got a prophecy of when John the Baptist would be born. They said in the in the Dead Sea Scrolls, it says that there would be two messiahs, Messiah of Israel and the Messiah of uh, of uh, a priestly Messiah. Uh, Messiah of Israel. The what? Priestly Messiah. Uh, Messiah. Okay. Yeah, two messiahs. One of them was from the uh, tribe of Aaron, and one of them was the Messiah, the Messiah. And it, everything, everything, there's one particular scroll. It's not a scroll, it's a fragment, but it's a significant fragment. It has details about Yeshua and John the Baptist. It's got a little, a little, very little about John the Baptist, but the thing is, it dates the crucifixion of Yeshua to the year. It's incredible. And it, it gives... Stuff. Oh, it is. And why the scholars haven't been telling you people this, or us, let me put this up, us. Why they haven't been telling us this stuff is because of what I told you earlier. You said, why are they not digging this stuff up? This is why. It's because they don't want this knowledge to be set free because knowledge is being suppressed right now. I promise you there is technological. Let's just get into a secular view. Technological information that is available, that has been available for years, that has been suppressed, that people are just now beginning to find out about, and they're getting angry. We could have, we could have had technology that would have provided power to the entire earth free. Are you talking about like free energy technology from UFO, back engineering UFOs? <clears throat> no, I'm talking about stuff that uh, Tesla discovered. Oh, There's stuff. That's, out yeah, there. that's interesting too. Yeah, that is, that is, I mean, like, what did he do? I mean, did he, do you think he discovered like uh, free energy, I guess? Yes, I do. I, I think that's why I can't think of the guy's name is a very ultra rich guy that suppressed the knowledge. He said, I'm not, I'm not building this, uh, this equipment so I can provide free energy to everybody. He said, I want to make money off of it. And the guy's filthy rich already. And, and it would, it would have changed the world. It would have made, it would have made things so different. And, and listen, there are powers out there. There are people in positions of power authority that will poke the, King of England in the chest and tell him what to do. They're the guys with the purse strings. Yeah, they're the guys that are that are creating these wars. Yes. We are just a bunch of we're just a bunch of slaves doing their bidding, and I think that's about to come apart. I think the time we call it we call it the uh, one thousand year millennial reign. That's a that's a thousand years of peace. That's what's coming, and. Whether you believe it's through Jesus, whether you believe it's through Yeshua, which is the same person, or you believe it's through technology. I believe it's all of the above. I believe this is all going to culminate at one point in time, but we have got to stand our ground. And, and, and as a religious person, I encourage people, uh, hold on to what, what God is telling you. And peace and love, you can't go wrong with those two things, bud. You just can't go wrong with that. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I, if, I wish more people thought that way, you know, because I think, but I do see something going on. I feel like people are waking up though. I feel like it's a bit, it's, it's a huge thing around the world. Like people are really starting to come into their, whatever this is that was, that was happening. It's like a consciousness expansion. It's like, it's everybody's starting to, you know, be more aware of what their reality is. Right. Yes, yes, they are. And, and it, things, let me give you a simple example. In the Bible, it talks about, <clears throat> um, it talks about how uh, the, the time of the coming of the Messiah, no one knows the day or the hour. Well, if you understand the biblical holidays, it explains what that is. That's the day of Rosh Hashanah, which is a uh, feast of trumpets, a uh, uh, in uh, Yom Teruah is another name for it, but it's all the same day. No one knows the day or the hour. Well, they don't. Whenever they were watching for the uh, uh, the timing, 
they had a two day day. It was actually 48 hours long rather than 24 hours. What they were talking about is a specific day, not just an arbitrary day and sometime during the year, they were talking about Rosh Hashanah. It's a two days long and nobody knows the day of those two days. They don't know which day and they don't know which hour but it would be the time that the return of the Messiah. So there's a lot of information that's coming out in just buckets. Now, all over the world, people are calling, people are calling me, talking to me about what I know about what I just explained to you. There's seven big feast days, and this is all tied to the Dead Sea Scrolls, all tied to the ancient times of, of the biblical history, all tied to the Bible. If you know those things, Knowledge of the Bible just doubles oh, within within six months. You could double your understanding of the Bible by learning the holidays, the feasts of God. That's how big knowledge is beginning to explode now. That's amazing. And then would you, I was going to say, would you say it was the Dead Sea Scrolls that kind of solidified your, well, I mean, you probably always had a belief in Jesus, I'm guessing, because you're, you're a believer, but like, did, was it the Dead Sea Scrolls that kind of solidified that and backed it up? Or did you have to go with other research outside of the Dead Sea Scrolls to kind of nail down who this person was? No, no, actually, actually, it's, I came to that understanding through simple, innocent understanding. Uh, but the Dead Sea Scrolls, that links, what, what the Dead Sea Scrolls do is they link Yeshua, because I, the, his name wasn't Jesus. His name was Yeshua. It, it links him to the Jewish people and the Jewish people to us and us to the Jewish people. Because if you understand that, there's really, there's not a big change that's going to have to be made. Uh, Christianity is going to have to turn loose a lot of its pagan origins. But other than, I mean that respectfully, they're going to have to turn loose to their pagan origins. But what will happen is the Jewish people look at, at Yeshua and go, wait a minute. He's not necessarily the Messiah ben David, which there are two of them, Messiah ben David and Messiah ben Yosef, so the son of Joseph and the son of David. They'll look and they'll say, wait a minute. He's not a, he wasn't a conquering king like we expected in the son of David. He is, though, a suffering servant, like is explained in the story of the Messiah ben Joseph, this Messiah ben son of Joseph. So there you go, is more knowledge is exploding. And so that's what tied me, and it ties it to the stories. There's a, there is a huge awakening coming, huge awakening. This is amazing. This is, this is all so interesting. Um, I'm trying to think if I have any other questions for you. Uh, I don't think I have any other questions. Um, is there anything else you wanted to go over before we finish up for tonight? Or uh, we've been going about 45 minutes, but like, I just see if you wanted to cover anything else that you think will be important or if, or if that was everything. Yeah, there, there is. Um, Israel is going through a very difficult time right now. Israel and, and the United States is going through a very difficult time right now. And people are going to have to make a stand. Make a stand one way or the other, for goodness sakes. Hot or cold, make a stand because we're, we're going to go through some judgment time. And it's already happening. Uh, we, as a people, as a nation, or we, we're either going to fall or we're going to rise to new heights within the next few years. And at our trust in God is going to have to come alive within each of us. And, and, and it's a learning process. I don't want it, it, For example, I, I, I don't want people to go out there and start doing Christmas and, and Easter because those are not biblical holidays. People think they are, but they're just not. And, and Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Well, the commandments he was talking about wasn't the stuff that we're doing today. And I mean this with kindness and respect and love to my Christian brothers and sisters. Uh, those holidays are not where it's at. You, you don't learn anything from Santa and his sleigh bells and the reindeer. You don't learn squat. But you take that story back to the birth of, of Yeshua, and you see massive amounts of information about what God has already established for us. So... Yeah, that's what I'd like to get across to your audience tonight is get ready. 
because there's knowledge that is coming and it is wonderful knowledge, but there's also a painful time coming because we have let things go bad and we're going to have to correct it. And it's going to be difficult for a while. Wow. That's, that's really well said. Um, I, well, um, I'm trying to think, well, if you could tell everybody where to find your website and thank you for doing this, this was awesome. And, um, and uh, yeah, and thank you. And if you could tell everybody where to find you, where to find your website and where to find your, do you have a, in your book and everything like. Yeah. And what, what I want from the people is this, I don't want money. I don't want you to send me money. That's not what I'm out about. I'm about what I'm on a mission. And that mission is to return the treasures of Israel back to Israel and for, for the use by our coming Messiah. That's what this is for. And I talked to a rabbi. He said, Jimmy, do you realize what this is, what you found? I said, no, not really. It's a lot of important treasures. And he said, it's more than that. He said, this is the dowry for the coming bride which lit up and within my heart, I thought, oh my gosh, that makes so much sense because God always, every father, good father leaves a dowry for his, for his family. And God has left a dowry sitting in the deserts of Israel, waiting for the coming of the Messiah, who's always considered to be the, the groom that will marry his bride and he will have the treasures that he needs to build a home for her. That's what these treasures are. That's what this is for. So there's there's much more coming. And I want everybody, if you want to do anything for the Copper Scroll Project, get, say some prayers that I stay within God's will, that I serve God as I'm supposed to, uh, because there are a lot of wicked things coming out there. There's some really hard things coming against me right now. But with God's help, we'll get through this. And that's all I want. I don't want their money, but I appreciate it if they considered it. Thank you very much. If you thought about that, but that's not what I want. I want your prayers. I want you to pray for our safety, for my family, for my friends, for the guys that are working with me and, and for the people of Israel and for the people here in the United States. And I got to tell you, I thank you very much for the opportunity to get on here with you, but I appreciate this. Yeah, it was, this was really interesting. I, I love talking about ancient history. Let me ask you this. Do you think that uh, this is, I probably should ask this before, but this is, this is interesting. Like, do you follow the, 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 the it's not a, I don't know if it's really a conspiracy theory, but do you follow the theory that the Israelites were, were actually Egyptians too, that they, that Moses led them out of Egypt and, and that they were uh, originally Egyptian? Do you believe that? Or do you, do you think that they were just always a separate race or what do you think? No, they, they were sad. I mean, you can just simply read the Bible and get that, but you also get it in other, other documents as well. The Egyptians were their own race of people. The uh, Israelis were an enslaved group of people that were, came there through, um, through Joseph, the story of Joseph. He, he brought his family there and they built, they grew into a nation and then they had to grow They had to leave. They had to separate because the oppression had come so heavy upon them. I, you know, if people want to believe that that's fine. And dandy. That's their belief system. Do I think there were other nations involved in this? Absolutely. There were like 70 other nations that went with the uh, Israelis and Israelites and left and went back into the promised land. So yes, there were, yeah, there were, there were, and maybe there were Egyptians with them. There were, you know, many other groups of peoples too that wanted to be tied to and linked to the, um, the Israelites. So yeah, yeah. they there. Sorry. Oh, sorry. What were you saying? No, that's it. That, they just were, there were other nations with them, but they needed to keep, they need to keep that separate. Um, they need to keep the Israel, Israelites separate from the, uh, uh, gosh, like from the Americans, for example. But let me tell you this. I believe that there are a lot of people within the United States and around the world that, for example, I, I believe there's a possibility that I'm from the tribe of Benjamin. And that's a long story, and I don't have time to go into that. But And there's other people around the country, the United States, that, that think they're from Issachar, that believe that they're from Judah, that believe they're from... Uh, any of the 12 tribes. And I believe that's entirely possible. Do you think that's from past lives? 
No DNA, just simply a DNA, uh, follow the DNA strands. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's so cool. That's so interesting. I've never done that yet. I mean, I'm, I'm Lebanese myself, which means like I have a tie to that area as well. Not Israel, but I have a tie to like the Middle East, but my family's like real American. You know, my dad was in Vietnam War and stuff like, but like we just, yeah. just happens to be our ethnic background, you know, like. Sure, that's interesting. But and then my mom's like Italian and Greek, so it's like Mediterranean. I'm like real Mediterranean, but so I've always loved stories from around that area, like that. And I that's why I love the story of the Anunnaki and the and the and the and the Book of Enoch and the Bible story. It's all so interesting to me, and I think it has a lot of meaning for where we're headed in our. I think to understand your future, you have to know your past, right? Absolutely, you very well said. That's important for everybody. You know, know your family, try to start recording your family's history and, and try to get actual documentation. It's important. It's important to your children. And I had my grandson came to me the other day. He said, he said, Paul, that's what he calls me. He said, we want you and Nana, which is my wife and, and my grand, other grandparents to sit down. We want to record you and you to tell stories about the family and what you believe and where you're, where you're coming from. He said, we think it's important that we record this and document it for the future generations. And I was so proud of him because he's only like 15, 16 years old now. So that's, that's so cool. awesome. Yeah, it is. It's amazing. And every family should do that. Yeah. Yeah. That is so cool. That, that's, that's, a, that's awesome. That's, a, that's amazing. I, that, that's, all, that's all we have, right? And, but I mean, like that, that's all our family's going to want to know about what we were like and what our previous generations were like you know yeah, instead of having to yeah. go through ancestry.com you know like i mean <laughs> if if we if we passed down our stories a little bit better or our heritage a little bit better then we would all know where we came from yeah and and i encourage it for you for like my grandson nathan and, and phineas and the boys want to learn this stuff i encourage all of you gosh get in there and learn all you can about your family because that strengthens your family. It gives you a foundation for your family to stand on. Yeah, this is, this is great. Well, can you tell everybody the name of your, or your website and where, and where to find your information? And, and thank you again. Yeah, the, my uh, website is the Copper Scroll Project, uh, CopperScrollProject.com. You can use any search engine, engine and, and type that in and you'll find us. Uh, I, don't, I don't keep it real updated because a lot of things that I learn, I have to keep it quiet. I mean, we're talking about billions of dollars here sitting out in the middle of a desert. So I kind of have to keep some of it quiet. And, and some of the research that I discover, I have to keep it quiet because sometimes it's pretty controversial. Yeah, I, I know. And but YouTube will flag us. You know what I mean? I'm going to try to put this on YouTube, but I think we should be, I think we should be good, you know, but I mean, like you always got to watch because there's always that too. Yeah. There's censorship. Oh yeah. It's, 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 uh, it's insane, but yeah, well, it was really nice meeting you. And until next time when we should do this again and thank you. I would love to, you just give me a call and uh, I'll be coming back. Uh, I'm going to be going to Israel and sometime in the spring, uh, give me a call again and we'll do this again. All right. Thanks, Jim. It was really nice meeting you. Have a nice night. Oh, I enjoyed it very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Me too. Have a good night.